Hello, and welcome to Creepy Core and Folklore, the show about creatures, encounters, old tales, and myths. I'm your host, Iona Wayland, a dark fantasy author, mental health professional, and overall curious person. I want to join other spooky souls and hear about these unusual stories. Hello, spooky soul, and welcome to episode 20. And if you've listened to the revamp, the vamp 10th episode, my goal was to have a very special episode every 10, like on the 10th one each time. I don't know if that's what's going to continue to happen, but God damn it, I'm doing it right now. <laughs> so at least it's going to happen two times in a row. Um, this episode is sponsored by nap time, um, per usual. And also, uh, we're going to focus on, uh, religious tome accuracy, specifically later on, more specifically biblical, biblical accuracy of angels. I figured because there are many holidays that happen in the month of December, and this is the first week of December, that I'm just going to uh, scare everyone with what angels, quote, actually look like, unquote. I know that I've shared in the past uh, that um, I was raised in a deeply religious household, and I'm not going to get into the specific religion because I feel like every Uh, organized religion can have uh, good and bad things to it and really beautiful uh, cultures with it as well as some problematic ones as well. So it doesn't really matter specifically the type of religion, but I do remember that there was lots of like fire and brimstone and like look at these creatures and beasts and celestial beings that exist on different planes. And I remember being fascinated by it. So I hope I don't freak you out. Um, I also equally do hope that I freak you out. (laughs) Um, And though I have my own belief system now, I I also respect and do imagine uh, that those entities exist to some respect. So biblical angels are what we're going to go over today for this special 20th episode, especially um, now that we've entered my least favorite month of the year. (laughs) And I was like, you know what, at least I can focus on some creepy things with my spooky soul friend. So angel actually comes from the Greek word angelos. And it's funny because just talking about my dark fantasy book for a second, Ashes, um, the main character's name is Angela. And I did that on purpose. And then her last name is Solomon, uh, meaning, uh, and I spelled it differently. I spelled it like solo man. And so I wanted it to her to be like a Solomon not only means like, you're doing something on your own, and you have to take this journey on your own, Uh, which is what I had her doing, Um, but also it can mean peace. So I wanted her to be the angel of peace. And that's my (laughs) prolific writer (laughs) Easter egg for you. Um, But it's really neat because if you think of places like Los Angeles or Los Angeles, it's related to angels. And I always thought that the word angel meant like peace giver, kind of like what I was describing for my main character, but it's not. The Greek word angelos, which I know I'm not saying correctly, um, but it means messenger. So this research article is what I used for the first chunk of this episode. And I'm going to have all of these research articles, of course, in the show notes per usual, because um, sometimes I know people are curious and they want to look at the same things I did. At least that, I, that's what I like doing. Um, and so if you want to check out Linwood Fredrickson's work, uh, I believe this is one of their like research articles, which I thought was really, really interesting. Um, and there was a ton of information in there, some of which I'm going to use for a different episode when I go over different types of demons. But um, there's this 
note that Linwood Fredrickson makes that angels get, quote, significance from what they do, not what they are. So this points to a hierarchy, end quote. So many religions have benevolent beings that can transcend time, space, and like affect our physical world. Uh, This is shown throughout many different types of spiritualities and religions. In the Western religions, the ones where these beings show up are in Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. And they are called angels. Then um, Fredrickson goes on to explain that there are also these transcendent neutral entities like jinnies or jinns or malevolent entities like demons. Um, but I, like I was saying before, I'll go over that in another episode. So angels are considered important, which I thought was really interesting that this writer pointed it out, that they are important because of their direct relationship to God in monotheistic religions, meaning, and God is the ultimate being in those monotheistic religions. And monotheistic means one God. Um, And angels are also almost seen as like semi-divine or even divine because of this relationship to the almighty being or creator. So many religions and cultures believe in these benevolent entities from other realms, but it's mostly in Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, and Zoroastrianism. Uh, Though for the Zoroastrians, it's in a slightly different way. And they believe that angels are really, quote, elaborated, end quote, on as as Fredrickson states. This writer also pointed out that these religions see the universe in a tripartite. And I hadn't heard of that word before. Um, But this means that things are broken up into three sections. So with regards to angels and angelic transcendental beings, this would be the celestial world, the terrestrial world, and the subterrestrial world. And uh, as you can imagine, the terrestrial world uh, is Earth, like the Earth as we know it, the Earth we're standing on, living on, that kind of thing. And then the celestial world, if you think about, um, is with regards to space or the heavens. And the last one, the subterrestrial world, is meaning subterrestrial, meaning under the earth. And when I think of under the earth, I think of the earth's core, like the different layers of the earth, but also the earth's core. That's what I imagine. Um, but there's also this connotation with subterrestrial of chaos, darkness, fire slash heat. And you can like imagine this in many different spaces like think of subterrestrial what lives there it's like oh is that where hell is is that where Hades is is that where an underworld it's like in the it's in the name subterrestrial under the earth underworld like it's all kind of related that's also potentially why people bury their dead and so it's interesting to think about those types of sections and how it's been split up into those kinds of filing cabinets, so to speak, in our brains so that we can process these vast spaces for ourselves. It also makes me think of on the flip side, the celestial realm. Think about how vast space is, outer space. We really can't tell what all else exists out there. We can't even get to the end of our planetary system let alone our solar system. And there are tons and tons of solar systems out there. And so to be able to even try to comprehend that, which human brains, I don't think really can, it's just called the celestial realm. So in the celestial sphere, uh, there are seven highest levels uh, that are sacred and holy. So an example would be Yahweh's name is so holy that it shouldn't be spoken can't more like and not humanly possible. In the celestial sphere, um, it's considered the highest level. 
And it's not only is it physically above where a human would be, like you have to look up to look at the celestial space, but also with that sacred and holiness uh, connotated with it, uh, that means that that would be where the supreme beings would be or the benevolent beings that can transcend time and space would be. So an example would be in Judaism where Yahweh exists and God or Yahweh has a name that's so holy that it shouldn't even be spoken or it can't even be said by the human tongue. In Christianity, there's bythos, which means there's two unknowing, un- unknowable g- beings, meaning Jesus Christ and God, which has gone by uh, several names like the that being has never really said to have said its name other than like I am um, or um, just God or Dios or whatever is said. But it's it's such a he, God is such a big being and such an everlasting being that transcends what the brain can understand that humans can't even know that being's name. And then in Islam, that is where in the celestial realm is where the powerful and almighty Allah is. Angels are thought to be able to send messages from God or the almighty being or creator to people from this celestial realm and tell humans about their life path as well as give revelations. This whole tripartite was kind of almost, I don't want to say disproven, but it was not seen as so black and white um, after the discovery that Earth is a part of an interplanetary system. It's not the center of the universe as humans had originally thought. However, that tripartite system still shows up in many different ways. Um, It's only changed the thought process a little bit or maybe offered more of a grayscale to it. So that tripartite thought process would actually translate in different ways, even to the human psyche. Um, This is where I get all extra interested um, because this is where mythology and psychology cross over. I guess theology as well crosses over um, and kind of intermingles with each other, which I really love. So uh, there was this weirdo Freud back in the day. Um... And I have many opinions about his teachings and his theories and things like that. But for an example as to how the tripartite uh, thought process shows up, um, despite my complicated feelings um, that I'm not going to get into, (laughs) um, he has a theory or he had a theory on personality and he, his idea, his original thought process was that it was split it up into, you guessed it, three different sections. And so that would be the super ego, which is the restricted and socially acceptable part of self. Um, this is the one, the mask that you wear in front of people. And I'm saying it um, in a facetious way and a sarcastic way but I also do understand that there are different ways that people act in different settings and that's totally okay and very very normal whatever the hell normal even means Um, and I also know uh, being a neurodivergent person myself um, that when someone has um, there's a thing called masking that people sometimes have to do, neurodivergent people have to do, um, to be able to kind of suppress their, um, I want to, I don't want to call them symptoms, but I guess glimpses that they are neurodivergent because they're not seen as socially acceptable. And that's done for safety reasons, although it is traumatic for the brain. And that's a whole other, oh my gosh, I could, I'm trying not to rant about a million different things right now. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but that's just me saying that, though I'm saying this kind of in a snarky way, that I do understand that there are some parallels to the most recent uh, personality studies and trauma studies out there. So that is just one example of how the super ego or the mask would work in the socially acceptable realm and how it presents to other people. 
Next is the ego. And this is the conscious and the mental life. Like this is the thoughts and what you consciously can write and think about and what you know that you're doing, you're consciously aware of. Whereas the id are the subconscious and the instincts. And so this talks about how this is this is I think where I personally have the biggest I I have the biggest uh, divergence from Freud's teachings and what makes me really skeptical about and I'm pretty skeptical about and not just Freud stuff but like anything I learn in the psych realm um, I make sure that you know there are studies about it and if there's most updated studies and if things have changed that kind of thing as best I can anyway but the id uh is like I don't know it's just at least maybe it was the way I learned about it but it seemed like for Freud had this thought of like everyone is evil inside or like everyone really wants to do xyz and we're all like animals and well I guess technically humans are animals but it's like we're all these like beasts that want to do like the worst stuff but with our ego and our super ego we're able to repress that and we're able to like overcome it and I just think that's a little dramatic um I do think that there are uh, my short version of all of this is there are some things that I think parallel into our current state of the world and how people are in, into current personality theory. But also this is a bit reductive, but it's a perfect example of the tripartite thinking process where it's kind of simplified. It's split into three things and there are those three spaces that Um, can exist together. So going back to how different religions uh, have their teachings about angels, we're going to specifically talk about the Hebrew scriptures um, first, and then we'll delve deeply into Christian teachings. In Hebrew scriptures, there's Yahweh, Lord of hosts. Um, It's the Sabbath and the heavenly army. So the heavenly army uh, is made up of forces that fight against evil. The heavenly army will guard the entrance to paradise. Um, Another part of the heavenly army will punish evil doers. Um, Another part of that heavenly army will protect the faithful. And Others have the role of revealing God's word. So there are two archangels listed in the canonical Hebrew scriptures. Canonical meaning like it's right there. You can read it in the Hebrew Bible. Um, First is Michael, the archangel. And that is the warrior leader of heavenly hosts. He's seen as the absolute supreme leader of the heavenly army. The second archangel listed in the canonical Hebrew scriptures is Gabriel, and Gabriel's role is to be a messenger. Um, Then there are two archangels in what Fredrickson describes as the apocryphal, or um, my little note here is like, canonical is true, and apocryphal is maybe not true. (laughs) So apocryphal is like, this might be folklore based off of it, or legends based off of it, or alternative interpretations from it um but these are the archangels in the apocryphal hebrew bible there are two listed one of the archangels name is raphael and that name means god's healer slash helper and i'm not quite sure if raphael heals god or humans or other angels maybe i'm not sure what healer means and um helper makes Uh, a bit more sense to me because that could be seen as like I don't know for some reason it's hard for me to grasp like a supreme being or an ultimate creator needing healing but they would probably need help in my mind it's like you're running an entire solar system that particular person imagines what God made Um, and so you'd think that they would need help (laughs) with that like A sign of a good leader is to delegate. And I feel like that's how I imagine Raphael is and what he does with his role as an archangel. And then the second archangel listed 
in the apocryphal Hebrew Bible is Uriel. And that name means fire of God. So apparently the role of this archangel is to watch over worlds lowest part of hell so um and this is talked about and potentially um interpreted from second address or address there's also one arch demon listed which there was tons of stuff about demons which i found very interesting and there was a weird hierarchy there as well that i want to uh really get into for another special episode at some point in the future. But um, the archdemon is, of course, Satan. And I'm going to just save that particular thing from the for the demon episode. But it's worth noting that to be an archdemon, that he had to be an arch an archangel at some time at some point in his life. So now flipping over to Christianity specifics, there are archangels discussed previously in the in their Old Testament, and those archangels directly match the Hebrew scriptures we just talked about in Judaism. However, in the New Testament, there are things specifically called, you won't believe it, <laughs> celestial beings. Surprise, surprise. So these celestial beings are put in seven ranks. They go angel, one is angels, two is archangels, three is principalities, four are powers, five are virtues, six are dominions, and seven are thrones. In the Old Testament, the only additional ones other than um, Michael, Gabriel, Raphael, and Uriel, uh, there's an extra one. There are an, There are extra two named cherubim and seraphim so eight would be cherubim and nine would be seraphim so there's a total of nine choirs so the terminology are choirs of angels in later christian mystical theology so let's go over this is the moment that i was the most excited for personally um these are the ones that come to mind for me where I'm like these are wild looking um let's look at what they actually look like so we're going to start from the top of the rank so the the rank I listed of the nine choirs went from like not weakest but like lowest to highest so the ninth choir is the highest and most powerful so I'm going to start with the seraphim so the seraphim are called the fiery ones which uh, kind of reminds me of Uriel um, because it's like the fire of God, even though Uriel is an archangel. So before I f confuse you, um, let me stop making weird comparisons right now. <laughs> um, so seraphim are considered the fiery one ones. Um, it's the plural of seraph. They have multiple faces, multiple hands and feet. Um, they have six wings in total. And four are used to cover themselves in the presence of God, while the last two are used to fly. And so this is said to be done in an act of humility when in the presence of God there. It's like the four are covering cover the chest and the torso and the um, the chest and torso regions and kind of cover up as much of the body as they can while the last two help them fly from place to place. Um, these are said to be constantly singing and worshiping God. And they're the lyrics for um, the words that are used in these serenading and this constant worship of God is that they sing holy, holy, holy continuously. And I'll get into this later, but whenever I, anytime I ever read about um, what biblical, biblically, I don't know why that word's so hard for me to say, biblically accurate angels look like, I'm always like, how the hell did we get to a place where it's like an Adonis with like little wingling things, um, just like 
hopping around and hugging people. Like, I don't understand how that happened, but I'll get into that later because uh, that's what I figured out from my research. But it's very interesting that these do sort of look humanoid, I guess, with their many faces, hands, feet, and six wings, but they sort of have like humanoid faces. Um, <laughs> it feels weird to say it's like, oh, they look human with their multiple faces. Okay, so then the eighth choir is the cherubim. These are the closest to God. They, I think physically, um, they encircle the throne and emit fiery light to represent his love. Um, They're described as looking like fiery serpents. Um, No others, not even other divine beings can look right at them. Like you cannot look at them when they are in their true form. There are only four of them. Each one have four humanoid faces, um, again with the multiple faces, and they also have six wings. When they land on earth, though, they leave the serpent form behind typically, and they have a very tall humanoid appearance. And this is what made me wonder, like, wait a minute, if you think about Adam and Eve and that story, and if you're not familiar with it, so there was Adam and Eve and they were in the, uh, they were the first um, humans made. Um, And this is in, I think the book of creation. I should look this up instead of just riffing, but I don't want to. (laughs) But um, they were in the garden of Eden and a serpent, and everyone says it's a snake. It's not a snake. It's a serpent. Some serpent creature uh, who was secretly Satan tricked them into eating the um, the fruit of knowledge. And by doing so, they were banished from the Garden of Eden because it was the one like fruit that they weren't supposed to eat because it had too... It, it, it was too much for their human brains to handle and it wasn't their role to their role was to be a human and populate the earth their role was not to be a celestial being and so then satan was find, found out to be trying to con, like convert people into having that knowledge and to trick people into directly defying god and so then god um like banished satan to hell i thought that Satan used to be an archangel, but it turns out that's not true because as soon as they said they looked like a serpent and they had many faces and many wings, it made me think of this particular story. And I was right. It was Satan. Satan was a cherubim, which is hilarious when you think about how cherubs are depicted (laughs) in artwork. Like, how did this happen? (laughs) How did we get chunk of babies chunk of naked babies that have little lumps of wings fluttering around and you know shooting people with arrows which I'll get to Cupid in a little bit but it's just really wild to me how this is like freaking scary and horrible sounding like this is a horror show to have this four-headed six-winged serpentine on fire thing that you can't even look at somehow turn into a chunky baby. These cherubim are also said to keep the celestial records and they're sent to do great tasks, like the biggest tasks. An example would be expelling humankind from the Garden of Eden. So even though one fucked that up um, and tricked Adam and Eve, another one banished all humans from it and to this day is said to be guarding the Garden of Eden so that people cannot enter it. Um, It's not, it's not accessible to humans anymore. Um, I think, uh, I think uh, I could be reading this incorrectly. I didn't write this down on my notes, but I feel like I remember reading um, that one was sent to expel people from Sodom and Gomorrah whenever uh, God went to like wipe it out with fire and brimstone type of thing. But Let's move on to choir number seven. These are the thrones. So these are also wild looking. 
these are the ones that when I was telling my friends um, about like what I was researching, they were like, oh, it's the it's the 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 giant swirly thing with eyeballs. And I'm like, yes, that's one kind. (laughs) But um, I think this is they're just so like distinctly different than something that's humanoid that it sticks in your mind. And so the thrones are great glowing wheels like wheel shapes covered with many eyes. Um, there's an, a virtual artist that I love that makes, um, they, they draw like thrones um, and they make like accurately depicted thrones. And it, it's really, really creepy, but very incredible. I'll try and find the um, artist, uh, the, this virtual artist that I follow on Instagram. Wow, that took me way longer than I thought it would to find this. Um, Instagram is not working. Um, I love Instagram so much and I don't care how old that makes me sound. (laughs) I know TikTok is the thing and I still do post to TikTok, but sometimes I forget it exists and I forgot, forget to put stuff on there. But um, the person is Alex Howard um, and uh, their film director and he had his handle is Alex Howard XX. Um, at least that's what it is on Instagram. And he makes these digital um, or these virtual looking. Um, they're very realistic sometimes. And then other times they're like creepy. I don't know. It's, it's very neat. It has an AR feel to it. Um, but there's this like, listen to me not knowing what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, but he... They include cryptids, um, like creepypasta type cryptids, um, the biblically accurate angels, um, extraterrestrials, and like UFOs or UAPs if you're like really cool and up on the new lingo. (laughs) Um, And they're just like really beautiful creations of uh, these visuals behind what things would look like if you saw them in real life. Yeah, Alex Howard has some cool stuff. But anyway, back to thrones. So there are these great glowing wheels covered with many eyeballs. Um, They're considered God's chariot. Um, They dispense judgment and carry out God's desires for humankind. They can exist in this like state of transition between celestial and human worlds. So sometimes they can like... Um, they can be in that liminal space in between. They're also considered heavenly governors. They keep the balance between matter and spirit, good and bad. Next up, we have the dominions or dominations. They take on the orders from the seraphim and cherubim. They're considered almost like these worker bee drone type things. They keep the cosmos in order. Um, They help to balance God's love and judgment. They are seen sending, which this makes me question a lot of stuff. Like this makes me want to include something similar in like a future book or something to explore this next point. But they apparently send power to authority figures. And I'm like, what do you mean? What do you mean? Does that mean like kings, queens, monarchy stuff? Does that mean political figures? Does that mean like I could see like chiefs, chieftains of tribes? Like where, where are the boundaries here? Um, And that's, that's something that I find very interesting. Like who, I guess God would make that decision. Um, But then I could also see Uh, a mortal person trying to uh, I want to say like groom a population and thinking that they got power from the dominions or dominations because that that's been done before I mean there's been emperors there have been pharaohs um, there have been religious leaders and political leaders and definitely monarchies that have claimed that they were in power because they were divinely chosen. And it just really makes me wonder, like, if 
if this is true, like, how is that decision made? It, it would be really cool to explore that in a future book, you know, because I have so much extra time on my hands. I'm going to, I can just like write books on a whim. <laughs> oh, man, it, it just really makes me wonder, like, where are the boundaries to this, uh, this role? Uh, the two, I don't know if these are two different dominions or if this is one dominion with two different names, like called different names, but I have written down here Zadkiel and Hashmal, and these are considered the chief of this order of angels or this order of choir. Next up, we have the virtues. These are very interesting. They look like sparks of light. Um, these are said to maintain the natural world. They take orders from the angels above and turn them into miracles for the de- for the deserving. This again makes me question like this, just like the dominions makes me wonder like, what does deserving mean? Because if there's this following of like, oh, I got this because I'm hashtag blessed, that's what it makes me think of, that can create a caste system. And so that has to be like, that could go wildly, wildly horribly. (laughs) This can be taken in wildly different directions and different interpretations. And it can be taken advantage of like not saying that virtues themselves are the ones that make mistakes or anything like that because they're technically divine uh, or semi-divine and they are carrying out orders that are told to them Um, but more like how did humans how can humans manipulate that belief system and wrongfully gain the trust of people or wrongfully avoid critiques I just find this fascinating clearly I will stop (laughs) clearly or I wouldn't be blabbing about it in your ear right now um so when they take their earthly form because the only one that we've heard the only one that we've heard about taking their earthly form so far has been the cherubim um but when they take their earthly form they are typically seen as musicians artists healers and scientists, which is again something that I find found very interesting. I was like, what do you mean scientists? What type? And um, apparently these are the types of like musicians, artists, healers, and scientists that work with like love and connection with others and also physics, like specifically physics. (laughs) So I'm like, wow, (laughs) that's really interesting. Also, because there's there's so much reason, there's so much space for theology, not just the Bible, but theology and science to overlap. Like there's tons of stuff that support each other. And it's like kind of this myth that's been rampant where um, this falsehood of like, oh, if someone's religious, then they can't believe in science. Or if someone's really scientific, then they can't have a religion or be spiritual. And that's not true. They can they can really like support each other. And so this is just a, a teensy weensy example of like how science is brought up in biblical tomes. The virtues, uh, two of these angels, the two that helped Jesus ascend into heaven after um, his crucifixion, uh, the two angels are said to be virtues. Uh, they were they helped with his ascension. Then next up are the powers. Um, These are brightly colored hazy fumes. In my opinion, these are the most beautiful. It gives me goosebumps talking about this. Uh, I don't know why. (laughs) Um, I think that's this. If I imagine what the inside of my brain looks like, and you can call me an airhead if you want to, but I imagine the inside of my brain being like these different colored hazy fumes. That's kind of like what my internal world or space looks like to me. Um, uh, whenever I'm in imagination zone out land or whenever I'm writing or creative or if I'm thinking about things from work that I'm trying to process I often feel that like hazy glowy feeling and so whenever I read how the powers are these brightly colored hazy fumes um, it's I don't think I'm an angel <laughs> but um, it was just neat because 
the way I'm conceptualizing the inside of my brain kind of is reflected and has been thought of before about other beings. So I thought that was really interesting. So these brightly colored hazy fumes patrol between heaven and earth. Um, These are the angels of birth and death. They also preside over demons who plan to overthrow the world. And some people even believe and have the interpretation that powers uh, maybe could become evil or are evil um, or maybe represent sin. But experts in theology say that they serve as advisors in terms of religion, theology, and ideology to humankind. They don't see them as like tricking anyone or having an ulterior motive. They're just there for like helping people with advisorship. Next up, we have the principalities. These look like rays of light. And it was funny because I was talking with a family member and uh, during the summertime there were, it was very, very thunderstorming, thunderstormy uh, this past summer, uh, specifically with um, in the northern Appalachian region. It may have been in the mid and southern Appalachian region, I'm not sure, but at least where I live, that's where it was. Um, and because of the storm clouds, the I think they're like cumulonimbus clouds if I'm remembering correctly I don't know (laughs) Um, but because of those big puffy clouds the way the sun rays would come through them there would be these beams of light that would trickle in that would like beam through certain sections of it and this family member told me they were like I used to think that those were elevators to heaven and I thought that was really cute it also brings back that ray of light feeling or visual brings back lots of really lovely memories of being in the woods in the summertime or when the sun is more slanted in the fall time where it would come through the trees like that. So the principalities, these rays of light, are said to oversee everything. They are said to guide our world and they overview nations, cities, towns, religions, and politics. They also manage earthly duties of angels that are below them. Um, Next up, we have the archangels. And this is the one that, at least for me, I was the most familiar with. And I also, before getting into the nitty gritty details, I was confusing archangels with like uh, thrones and like cherubim and stuff like that. But archangels appear only in human form. These are the pioneers for change. Um, They often assist people who are explorers, philosophers, human rights activists, and leaders. Um, The archangels, like listed before, are Michael, Gabriel, and Raphael. And they respond to matters that are not one-on-one personal level, but they respond to matters that involve all humankind. And last up are the angels or what I wrote as the quote regular unquote angels. Um, These are the most common type. I think there are many, many of them, though an exact number isn't really brought up. Um, These are messengers and sometimes personal protection to people. These are what people consider guardian angels. So those are the nine choirs going from most powerful to least powerful. I don't want to say powerful. Well, it's powerful, but also like the ones with the most um, uh, manipulation of the terrestrial world and even the celestial realm. Something I noticed was how wildly different they are, especially in how they were depicted in like visually how that how there are so many different interpretations of them and that's the beauty of having something written is that everyone's going to visualize something that's written completely differently and they're also going to interpret it differently I mean they may look for guidance on how to interpret certain things or descriptions um, but for the most part you can't everyone has their unique way of picturing something and so something that was interesting when I thought about how I've seen them in artwork is that 
you know, some of them have wings, but their wings would look completely different depending on like the color, the how many, like size, shape, that kind of thing. But then also, um, it's it's weird because it's like there would be these consistencies, like everyone looked humanoid or everyone had wings or whatever. And then there would be these inconsistencies between the things that seem to be in everything like the inconsistencies were in how the humans looked or the humanoid figures looked they were in how the wings were depicted so I thought that was very interesting so we're going to get into how angels have been portrayed in artwork throughout the ages so in ancient Assyria there's Lamassu and this is a protective deity. So remember how in the beginning of this episode, I was talking about how there are, their angels aren't the only ones that are these transcendent beings that are benevolent. Um, this protective deity, Lamasu, is an example of that. So it looks like a winged bull. It has the head of a human the body of a bovine or sometimes depicted as a lion and then large feathered wings and it's traced back to the 10th century bc then in ancient greece there are the we start to see winged humanoid figures like eros who uh also is considered cupid i believe but i'm not as familiar with ancient greek mythology um, and uh, they're considered the son of Aphrodite and Nike, who I was like, oh, <laughs> this is where Nike got their name. I can't believe I didn't think to look it up. I thought it was somebody's last name. But Nike is the Greek goddess of victory. This in the ancient Greek like winged humanoid figures kind of lasted between 510 BC to 323 BC. Then you've got the Hellenistic period, which was um, 323 BC to 31 BC. This is when the marble sculptures, oh my gosh, I'm getting goosebumps again. <laughs> um, the marble sculptures were absolutely gorgeous. So you got these statues of people, uh, of like gods, like people trying to, to depict these celestial beings like gods, but one uh, of the most noticeable was the winged victory of Samothrace. And I just looked up how to say Samothrace, and apparently I said it correctly on the first try. Correctly said very hesitantly because I'm sure I'm not having the accent correct. But um, so the winged victory of Samothrace. So Nike is depicted here with not only this, this part is wild to me not only with drapery um so like somehow in if you look up hellenistic period marble sculptures you will see what i am talking about they could somehow make the drapery like the the fabric look gauzy like and you can like see faces through the gauzy like i, I don't even know how they made it look like how they can make marble look like soft like beautiful flowing fabrics that's wild to me but um so not only did nike have drapery and beautiful drapery but also colossal wings in rome in the catacomb of priscilla and i'm definitely going to do an episode on catacombs in case you don't know what a catacomb is or what the catacombs are these are these hidden quarries like underground that christian Christians used as burial grounds I think and I, I definitely need to double check so take what I'm about to say with a huge grain of salt because I I really really could be wrong about this I believe it was during Christian persecutions like they they had to hide that they were Christian and then they also had to bury their dead in what was important for their religious practices but they had to do so underground in the catacombs but I also could be wrong. Maybe this was just a practice that was done then. Um, but the earliest artistic interpretation of an angel is actually seen on the wall of a catacomb. It's a scene from the Old and New Testament's Annunciation, which I did not know what this was. So this is when Gabriel, the archangel, announced 
to Mary that she would bear the son of God, meaning Jesus. I had no idea that that whole depiction had a name, like that that was called the Annunciation. Weirdly, in this uh, catacomb, this Priscilla catacomb, um, specifically about the Annunciation with that depiction, Gabriel didn't have wings at all. And I found that very fascinating um, because wings are the thing that I've seen the most consistently depicted, although the depictions do vary um, for multiple reasons. Um, I was really surprised when that was not in that wall painting. In the Byzantium 4th century, there was a prince's sarcophagus with a marble coffin, again, with this beautiful marble. And it had like a scene on it with these winged angels all over it. And I thought that was really incredible. During the Middle Ages, uh, there would there was gold ground into paintings. And so these angels were seen more in the background instead of the, in the foreground. And the angels were depicted as floating in the background. Um, and if some had divine messengers depicted, they would illuminate these manuscripts that they were or scrolls that they were reading from in the painting with that ground gold so that it would be like, even though it was in the background or off to the side, it was apparent that this, it was supposed to be symbolic that this manuscript that they were reading from was divine intervention and a divine message from an angel. In the Italian Renaissance, the very early Renaissance, uh, angels became more earthly. So you started seeing very human looking, almost like in my opinion, they looked like fairies, um, very pale fairies, but like fairies nonetheless, which also very interesting that we started to go paler and paler um, and, you know, consider uh fair skin divine but that's a different rant for another day um and this was a move toward naturalism the northern renaissance the wings used to be white gold or brown colors but these were reimagined from those colors and instead with a rainbow gradient and I think the rainbow wings are really really stunning there was a way they almost looked at like made it look like a prism type look in the wings. Next is neoclassism. This is where you see a lot of the naturalistic angels, like full-fledged naturalistic angels. These, This is what I personally would think of when I thought of uh, angels being depicted in artwork. It's these like Cupid-esque cherubs instead of the four-faced, six-winged flame serpents, the beautiful female figures, which up until now, I we really haven't seen or heard about any that are femme presenting, but there would be these beautiful female figures um, with a down-to-earth quote quality of early Renaissance models given to them. Um and this is another one where they, it looks like these like fairy scenes. Like sometimes they'll, you'll see like an angel playing like an instrument, like a harp or a violin or something, or like cooing over a baby. Um, and it's, it's just this very ethereal, but somehow naturalistic looking scene. It's very, very cool. Very interesting. Next up is modernism. And weirdly, the modernism was juxtaposed because it was inspired by Old Testament, which I found very interesting. Um, and in the, um, of course, I'll link this in the description below, there was like a little vignette of a interview with a, a Jewish modernistic artist and how, how he was inspired by even though he's Jewish, he was inspired by the Old Testament because the Old Testament is pretty much shared between Hebrew scripture and bib biblical st scripture. I'm really having a hell of a time saying biblical. Um, sorry, I just did that in your ear. Biblical. Um, then there's contemporary art. 
uh, this is still inspiration from the celestial subjects. Um, arts, uh, they, like the arts are depicting angels, but it's more of like um, nowadays there's so much to take from like there's so many people to be inspired by other artists other renditions and the person's own interpretation of angels I personally this is anecdotal this is not like written down anywhere um, or studied at least that I've found but I have personally found that more people are fascinated by biblically accurate angels and so I think that at least from my perspective of what I see on my small corner of online space is a contemporary art form like how I brought up that virtual artist before and these modern depiction or these new depictions of very old interpretations of angels. So thank you for sticking with me through all of those layers of angelology. I was surprised at the quote accurate end quote depictions of angels from their source and compared to the different ways I've seen them portrayed and then the ways I was just listing. I would love to know what your experiences have been. Um, Have you had an angelic exposure or experience in your life? Um, Have you heard someone saying that they had an angelic experience or exposure? Um, I think that would be very interesting to hear about. Um, What were you surprised about? Or did you know about all these different choirs already? Um, Also, if you have um, your own belief system, or if you were raised religiously like I was, like with a particular type of religion, I'd love to know how different religious leaders interpreted angels and the different levels of angels. I find that fascinating and would love to hear about your own experiences with them or just hearing you freak out about how wild they look compared to how they've been depicted over the years. Thank you for listening and I uh, to this very special angelology episode and I will talk to you next week. Thanks to all you spooky souls out there for listening to Creepy Core and Folklore. Follow on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and TikTok if you're looking for more uncanny content. If you have your own tales to tell, you can email creepycoreandfolklore at gmail.com. If you liked this, please leave a review wherever you get your podcasts or tell a friend who might enjoy these stories to spread the word. If you're interested in dark fantasy, check out my Hollowverse series. Ashes is available now in paperback and ebook on Amazon and audiobook on Audible, and the sequel is underway. I'm Iona Wayland, and I'll see you next time.